Before going to sleep that night, Amy tried to picture the city in her mind. Her image was that of a labyrinth of halls and corridors, low-ceilinged, dim, busy with human life and noise. But she could not see an outer shape, an encasement and end to it all. Yet she knew there had to be one somewhere. People had come inside from somewhere. The teaching machine said there were 80 levels and all levels were the same. Two wide corridors passed through each level. They were labeled A and B. Halls crossed the corridors. People lived in the blocks along the halls and worked in labs or factories on the corridors. There was a saying, halls are straight and have an end, corridors go on forever. For all Amy knew, that was true. Every hall she'd ever walked ended eventually in a shop or living space. She'd explored 140 blocks of Corridor A before turning back, and 90 blocks on B, and both had stretched on ahead, unchanging. Once, Janet had told her, there had been open spaces between building sectors, high windowed lobbies that went up 20 levels or more, and moving ramps, and trees, and flowers. But that was long ago, Amy knew, and all gone now. Maybe it had been better then. In the bunk below, Valerie mumbled in her sleep and then thumped the wall as she rolled over and took a deep, sighing breath. Amy put her ear guards down. It was time for the woman to go into deep sleep, and when she did that, she ground her teeth. The girl hated that sound, a furtive skit, 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 like rats chewing inside the walls. The bunk shook and Amy's eyes flew open to see the light flickering in the ceiling panel. The entire room was quaking with vibration from somewhere. She held her breath until the light became steady again. The shaking was normal. It happened most nights about this time and went on all night. But Amy always worried the lights might go out and there would be only blackness. Some people, she knew, prayed to their light panel and pasted bright things on the ceiling near it to encourage it to glow. She had tried doing that, but Valerie made her stop. It showed no faith in the authorities, Valerie said, and you had to believe they were in control. Otherwise, you got nowhere. Now Amy reached over and pressed her palm flat against the wall to feel the hum that never stopped. Although no one had ever told her so, she, she believed that so long as the wall hummed, so long as there was noise, the city was alive and the people in it were safe. The light flickered again, and she closed her eyes. If the lights went out, she didn't want to know about it until she woke up. She went back to thinking. The trouble was, she didn't know where to begin to look for a way out, or how long it would take to find it. If it took only a day, then she wouldn't have to worry about food and things like that. But if it took longer, where would she sleep at night? Sleeping in the halls was dangerous, and if she used her ID card for food, they could trace her and bring her back as a runaway. Then Valerie would be angry and Amy would be labeled a troublemaker and have to wear orange suits and maybe get sent to rehabilitation for chemotherapy and truth teaching. She didn't want to cause her mother more shame or get her in trouble. If she'd been a normal child, she would have been transferred to live in a training dorm, as other ten-year-olds were. But she was eleven and the authorities still had not transferred her. Valerie said it was because they didn't want Amy perverting other children with her reading. If she went away, Amy thought, Valerie would be glad because then the authorities might give permission for Valerie's friend Ted to move in. The two adults often told Amy that if it weren't for her living there, things would be a lot easier for them. So she would give them the gift of her space. She fell asleep feeling noble and a little sorry for herself, since she suspected that if she went away no one would miss her. Not only that, but they might be glad she'd gone. Still, she didn't want to cause worry or have the authorities start looking for her as soon as she left. She would have to think of some excuse to be away. The slam of the Senate door woke her. Her ear guards had slipped off and the sudden noise frightened her and set her heart racing. She could never understand how her mother could get the Senate door to make that much noise. Amy had tried sliding it as hard as she could and never got more than a soft clunk out of it. But then Valerie could make almost anything slam. Soon, I won't have to hear that anymore, Amy thought, listening to the sounds from the module. Maybe never again. If I left today... Her stomach suddenly felt lead-filled, and she shiv Her stomach suddenly felt lead-filled, and she shivered. 
What if they did get outside and it was awful out there like people said it was, and they couldn't get back in? Then what? If you do find a way, you can stand inside and look out and see, her common sense told her. If it's bad, you don't have to go out. You can come back here. But what if Ted had moved into her space while she was gone? This would not do. If she started thinking this way, she would give up before she started, as Axel had nearly given up. As the crazies had given up. Or she'd become like Valerie. Amy wasn't sure what was wrong with her mother, but she knew she didn't want to be like her, or for that matter, like any adult she had ever known. Except Janet. The Senate door rumbled open. Amy feigned sleep as Valerie emerged to dress and comb her hair. Prolonged forced intimacy had created an aversion between them that increased as Amy got older. With her eyes shut, she knew every move Valerie made. She listened to the morning ritual until the noises indicated her mother's near departure for her job. Then she half sat up under the low ceiling. I nearly forgot to tell you, Amy said. I'm going to ask to be moved into a training dorm. The woman stared at the piece of proto-mush she was eating for breakfast. They won't take you. She spoke without looking at the girl. They might. My record's pretty normal now. I can try. They won't take you, her mother repeated. I know. You tried to get me moved out of here? For the past year. For your own good. You should have a skill. Besides, the tone became defensive. I have a right to have some adult male company while I'm still young. It was one thing to want to leave. But quite another to realize she definitely was not wanted and hadn't been for a long, long time. Amy found she was both surprised and frightened by her mother's words, but she wasn't going to let Valerie know that. I'm going to apply myself, she said, so if you come back and I'm not here, that's where I'll be. No such luck. What does that mean? It means I'm going to be late for work if I don't quit listening to your stupid talk. She rose and put the remains of her meal into the freezer, then without a further word went out the door. Neither of them said goodbye, but then, Amy thought later, strangers usually don't. The girl climbed down from her bunk and stood in the middle of the tiny room, looking at it. This room was the only home she could remember. It was an odd feeling to think she might never see it again. It suddenly seemed a very safe place to be, except she wasn't wanted here. Although it wasn't her day to shower, she did so, half in defiance and half from an urge to start out clean. Before she dressed, she opened the freezer and, finding six proto-mush discs there, put them all into the cooker and set the timer for an extra minute to make them dry, like cookies. She put on both of her two clean suits, one on top of the other, and when the mush was done, ate one cake. When the rest were cool, she slid them into her shirt pockets. In the baggy, underpressed garments, bulging pockets made no difference. There was nothing else she wanted to take with her but her comb and toothbrush. She didn't own anything else. Turning on the roach ray, she policed the area. Keeping the room neat was her job, and she did it extra thoroughly. When the blankets had been folded on each bunk mattress, the ray shut off, and the dead bugs kicked out into the hall, she was finished with the room. There was no sign that she lived here except for her dirty sandals by the door. She washed them and put them in the micro cooker to dry before putting them on, and then she left.